Thanks everybody for joining us today. We're gonna go ahead and get started with our first Dog Days of Summer webinar from Talent Board. We're very excited to bring you, uh, well, this is the first of eight actually that we're doing throughout August. Thanks for joining us today. Today we're gonna to be talking about does recruiter experience matter and what candy winners do differently. And let's talk a little bit uh, about the Talent Board program first before I turn things over to Joe Murphy, who is our guest presenter today. Joe is not only the vice president uh, at Shaker, but he's also a talent board board member. I'm very excited to have him presenting today and I'll, I'll turn things over to him in just a bit. First and foremost, I wanna talk just for a second on talent board for those who aren't familiar with, with our organization. We are the first nonprofit research organization focused on the elevation and promotion of a quality candidate experience. We're all about shining a light on what's working and what's not with employers around the world. And we were founded in 2011 and this is the seventh year of our program. We are in the midst right now of our latest survey research where employers can participate, take a self-assessment of what they're doing from pre-application to onboarding, as well as targeting a population of their candidates, most of whom are those who were rejected, although it does include those who were hired as well, and target them with a similar survey about their experience at those same set employers. And we are in, again, the process of this year's survey capture. We're really at the tail end of North America, that closes uh, August 18th, and then EMEA and APAC, the other two regions that we run the research in, are still going through November 1st. So you can learn more about that, our program at thetalentboard.org. This is the scope of our global research that we have done to date, uh, including North America, which is US and Canada, many countries in EMEA, as well as APAC, um, and eventually one of these days, hopefully in South America, Latin America as well. These were the winners because every year, based on the highest candidate ratings that employers get, those that participate in our research, uh, it's confidential uh, otherwise, but for those that win our awards, we'd shop from the rooftops. And these were the winners from last year in 2016. And if you go to the talentboard.org, you can see the winners from all the years in the past from every region that we do the research. And we're looking very excited in, in about three to four weeks be announcing this year's 2017 North American employer winners from the candies as we like to call them and then we'll be celebrating in north america on october 2nd in nashville and this is where we're going to have our candy symposium and awards gala and our keynote speaker is shannon miller american gymnast and um, carmen hudson a longtime recruiting loom industry luminary is going to be our mc as well for that event so make sure to join us on october 2nd and of course, we want to give a shout out to all of our generous sponsors because we are a nonprofit primarily underwritten by these companies that you see in front of you. So I wanted to give them a shout out and thank them again as well for their support. So now, without further ado, I'm going to turn things over to Joe Murphy and Joe, take it away. Thank you, Kevin, and welcome, everybody. Thanks for logging in and joining us. Thanks for your curiosity. I hope to give you a, a couple of insights and answers to not how much experience does the recruiter have, but what is the recruiter's experience? What do they encounter in the execution of their job? And I've got a couple quick objectives I'd like to uh, review. We hope to accomplish in our quick time together. If you'll cue me up here, Kev. Next, please. I want to consider the decision-making challenge of talent acquisition, the survey, uh, asks a lot of information about candidate flow and candidate qualifications, recruiting practices. We're going to share a lot of those. So what I've really done, and I'm in a unique position to both be on the board of the talent board as well as a provider of uh, technology solutions to the talent acquisition community. So I'm going to share uh, the difference between practices on the use of assessment that we've identified with the survey and what winners are doing versus non-winners. I'm going to share a couple of case studies from some of our clients who also happen to be winners of the Candidate Experience Award on how they document the business impact from the use of assessment. And uh, we'll share some of those over the course of the next 30 minutes. Next, please. We ask, how many apps do you get per posting? And over 50% of the respondents for entry level hourly said they get uh, over 100 apps with 42% getting over 200 apps for each posting. That creates a tremendous workload for recruiters and trying to say, how do I find 
that one or two or three people I'm trying to hide from that requisition when you have that much waste. And obviously there's that 10% at the other end of the continuum, we get less than 25, but so heavily skewed to the high end where a large portion of our participants in the survey are, are inundated with applications. Next, please. The next thing we ask is, you know, you get all those applications from your own insight how qualified is your applicant pool? And 34% of the responding companies said half of their candidate population is unqualified. So we're getting inundated with lots of apps and lots of people that we do not believe are qualified for our jobs. And that sets up a couple of choice points for organizations is looking at their sourcing methodology to say, why am I attracting so many people who I do not feel are qualified? So it begs the opportunity to say, can you spend your sourcing dollars better to be more targeted, more focused, or can you educate candidates more specifically to prevent them from applying to jobs that they, they aren't qualified for? But the crux of the issue becomes the next slide, Kevin. 50% of your applicant pool is a waste of your time. And so the question becomes, how do we differentiate and decide who to reject and why and who to invest time in and why. And that's what we hope to discover a little bit through our next uh, couple slides. Next, please. We asked the participants in the survey a couple of questions about why they use assessments. And I parsed this out between the expectations difference between those organizations who you know, are identified as winners in 2016 versus everybody else. And we ask them three things. Are you using assessment to gain insight into the new hire performance to increase retention or to optimize candidate flow efficiency? And you can see that across the board, the winners have higher expectations for their business outcomes on every category, except for not applicable. And what that translates into is about 15% of the winning companies are not using assessments, where about 30% of non-winners are not using assessments. So the biggest uh, impact they're trying to achieve is gain insight into, can these people perform the job? Will they stay on the job? And can I help my recruiters with more candidate flow efficiency? Next, please. So let me ask companies, when do you use assessments? And what we have here is the percentage of candidates or companies using assessments prior to an interview versus after the interview. And what I've identified here is that those lower level positions, uh, hourly non-exempt entry level professional, experienced professional, um, and the biggest use of assessment pre-interview is in those higher volume entry level positions and it starts to level out across more experience. And there's a couple of reasons for that. And those uh, hourly entry level jobs, there's very little active recruiting going on. So you're getting a lot of hits to the website. And they're trying to learn something more useful in the resume about a candidate. So they're using the assessment to get objective standardized and potentially a predictive information about a candidate. As we move up the hierarchy in the organization, there's typically a more active network of referrals, outbound phone calls, sourcing passive candidates where that interview is taking place as an early touch point. Um, but how does this pay off for organizations? Let's look at the next slide. Here's a case study from an organization, pre and post implementation of an assessment. And this happens to be for a phone-based job in the um, consumer entertainment industry. Pre-implementing the assessment, they got about 14,000 candidates. That led the recruiters to now sort through using resume-based technology, and they had to identify 8,000 people that they deemed were unqualified. Then they conducted 6,000 phone screens, sent 3,000 people in for interviews, made 1,500 offers, and eventually had 1,100 people begin the process. They implemented an assessment, and after that, you know, slightly fewer candidates went from 14 to almost 13,000, and about 9,000, almost 10,000 candidates completed. And so, anytime an organization implements an assessment, there will be 
a level of opt-out where the candidate, for whatever reason, is unwilling to complete the assessment. And some of it is they just don't want to. And some of it, some assessments are actually designed to educate the candidate and engage them and say, we are going to see a little bit about the job and we want you to be a decision maker. And if you learn about the job and decide it's not right for you, please opt out. And so they lost about 25% of their candidates to that process. But now because they had assessment scores at a mouse click, they could identify more qualified and less qualified candidates. So they actually had to do 23% fewer rejections. Instead of rejecting 8,000 people, they were able to disposition 5,700 people. And that allowed them to very quickly identify who to phone screen. So they conducted 30 2% fewer phone screens the following year. That's over 2,000 fewer phone screens. Think about the recruiting workload in your organization if you could conduct 32% fewer phone screens for your highest population job. And that translated into a smaller population for face-to-face -face interviews. Again, 26% fewer interviews conducted. It translated into over 800 physical face-to-face -face interviews. So taking a lot of scheduling time, face-to-face -face time, hiring manager time out of the equation. And you'll see, and you drop down to the bottom, they actually had more people pass the drug screen and more people actually entered the next class on a fundamentally you know, a 20 to 30 percent lower workload across the entire recruiting cycle. So that's one case study of how an assessment helped recruiters have a more valuable experience, spend less time dealing with that 50% unqualified and getting down to the best fit talent quickly. Next slide, please. The second thing well-developed assessments offer is the second element that uh, organizations said they were looking for is new hire retention. And this happens to be a case study from a multi-year candidate experience award winner it's an entry level hourly position. And prior to implementing the assessment, they had a 24% new hire turnover at the 90 day mark. And after implementing the assessment, you can see the different uh, retention uh, timeline. It dropped to 16, from 24 to 16%. And so that's a 33% reduction in 90 day turnover as a result of using a career stability score uh, from an assessment that allowed them to look at corporate citizenship behaviors, rule following, and career history elements that correlate to career stability. So a great example of how assessment helps drive incredible economics. We talk about staffing waste and rework. So for every hire that you lose in 90 days, you got to repeat that hiring cycle. So you have two hiring cycles for one hire, the average number of days open, the cost of recruiting, onboarding, et cetera. Uh, significant uh, increase in recruiting efficiency and reduced cost to the organization. Next slide, please. Let's go back to the survey data. What do winners do differently than non-winners? And so what we have is we asked what types of assessments are being used from simple job specific skills questions, competency questionnaires, culture fit assessments, ability or cognitive measures, simulations, personality or work style questionnaires, case studies, and then again, the classic, we're not using anything. And the blue line is the winners, the red line is the non-winners. And so we can see in almost every case, except for case studies, winners are using this, uh, these various forms of assessment significantly more than non-winner organizations. And so, you know, it begs the question, what's happening differently in that candidate experience and that recruiter experience that contributes to that difference? And it goes back to higher expectations for how assessment is going to add value to their recruiting process and to their candidate experience. And it shows up this way. Next slide, please. So what we've been tracking now for the last more than four years, but I have the last four years of how the different types are, are being used. And they've been reasonably consistent across the previous three years, but we had a really interesting jump uh, in 2016 where the use of simulations and culture fit uh, assessments uh, jumped up dramatically uh, between 2015 and 2016. But you can see there, you know, 
flat line trending up, up and down a little bit, but you know, we noticed that just a significant increase in the use of those two particular types of assessments by the number of organizations that are uh, using them across the board. Next slide. One of the things that the academic research and our own kind of scoring is, is built on is the candidate wants to walk away from their application process feeling that you got to know them, that they had an opportunity to present their uh, knowledge, skills, experiences, ability, that's what the KSE, was I able to present myself? And so we asked them, based on what you experienced, how satisfied were you with your ability to present your capabilities to the organization? And what we have here is you know, a, a top down. So candidates who experienced the case study felt the most satisfied with the ability to present themselves. Simulation-based exercises next, behavioral job-specific questionnaires down to general screening questionnaires. And so we know that part of the positive candidate experience is giving them a type of application process in which they do more than paste their resume and do more than uh, answer a few questions. So more engaging, more dynamic uh, assessment experiences help create a sense of satisfaction on the candidate's uh, side. And next slide, please. The next thing we ask candidates is how long did it take you to complete the application? And then we correlated this with satisfaction with their ability to present by assessment time. It's kind of an interesting uh, curve shows up here. Uh, obviously, less than five minutes, they're less than satisfied. Uh, 15 minutes to 30 minutes is the peak. So that's really kind of the sweet spot, but it's it's almost flat in that 16 to 30, 61 to 30, but after 60 minutes, it just falls off precipitously. So we look at that kind of window to say, what's the candidate willing to give you in terms of time? And there's probably some differences and we haven't drilled down and looked into the data uh, specifically or at, at deeper levels, but you've, you've kind of got that 15 minutes to 30 minutes is really the optimal time they're willing to tolerate 60, but if your whole application and assessment process goes beyond 60 minutes, you're starting to lose the candidate in the process. Go ahead, Kevin, next slide, please. So let's talk a little bit about the use of assessments. And so we know that about 25% of the companies responding to the uh, candidate experience questionnaire are not using assessments. And then if you're using assessments, there's really two ways to use assessment. One is without in-house validation. And what that means is you're using industry scoring, normative data based on broad populations outside your organization. You've not actually conducted research to do what's known as predictive modeling or calibrating the assessment results to specific job performance in your company. But 53% of the respondents said, yes, they're doing in-house validation. And typically what that means is they will have collected assessment data on hundreds of candidates and collected job performance data. And performance data can be collected in a variety of ways from, uh, we use the three O's of uh, quality of hire. There's opinion data where you can survey the hiring manager with their opinion about a new hire the best you've ever hired, willing to rehire, they have performance potential, are you satisfied, you want more of those kind of people, uh, to objective observed ratings using a competency model, and so using a, a rating scale on each of the behaviors in your competency model, you can ask a hiring manager to rate individuals on decision-making, involves other people in decision, using data to support decision, has risk management contingencies in their decision-making, so whatever behaviors might be in your competency model. And then the third O is objective metrics. So production, productivity, attendance, things of that nature, and anything that you're capturing as a number. And those three types of data get put into a, an analysis to say, how does the assessment calibrate to predicting those specific behaviors? So good to see a lot of organizations, over half of the companies uh, are indeed using in-house validation. 
best practice. Next slide, please, Kevin. So um, what's the difference between winners and non-winners within that specific category? So we took that same pie chart, we divided it up and say almost 70%, 68.75% of uh, winners said they have conducted. We're down just in the neighborhood of 50%, 48% of uh, non-winners have conducted that in-house validation. Um, and a, a higher percent of non-winners are using assessments without validation. And again, we're down showing that you know, only about 15% of the uh, winners are not using assessments. So we're seeing different assessment implementation practices between those organizations who win. And part of that, my assumption is, is that you know, going through the rigor of doing in-house validation is another layer of ensuring that your measurement experience, your candidate evaluation is clearly linked and tied to the content of the job and performance metrics within your organization. So it's taking your candidate evaluation to a, a new level of uh, effectiveness. Next slide, please. So I'll share two quick case studies on how assessment data can be linked to predicting performance differences. And this also happens to be a multi, a case study from a multi-year winner of the Candidate Experience Award. And it's a sales position in professional services. And the organization does not use a cut score. They hire anybody they want on the assessment. And that helps really well to do longitudinal studies. And so this represents a couple thousand hires that were tracked over two years. And this represents the first year of sales results. And what we see is those candidates who scored in the bottom 30% of the assessment, that red bar measures their ramp up period. How quickly did they grow their territory? And you can see plugging along that yellow bar is the middle 40% of scores on the assessment. And again, you see they ramped up much more quickly than those who scored in the bottom third over the course of uh, the first four quarters. But then you look at those individuals who scored in the top 30% of the assessment and they dramatically improve their overall outcome quarter after quarter, you know, far outstripping uh, other candidates. And so this is an example of uh, assessment results being very powerful to help identify those individuals who learn faster, come up to speed quicker, and achieve higher levels of productivity. And this is, an, again, a professional services uh, sales role. Next slide. Again, this is uh, an organization who I believe applied for the first time this year on the benchmark only, but this is a phone-based job and they've been using assessment for a number of years. And we tracked a group of individuals over four quarters a phone-based job measurement called average handle time. And what we saw right off the bat in Q1, right out of training, those individuals who scored in the top 70%, so slightly above average, came out of training and were achieving their handle time objectives 25% faster than those who scored in the bottom 30% of the assessment. And we tracked that group of people over four quarters, and you can see it takes almost a year for them to asymptote where the people who, given the amount of training, supervision, extra reinforcement, and coaching, were able to get their handle time to a level that you know, was achieved immediately by those who scored in the top 70% uh, of the assessment. Economic gain of that translates into more calls handled with the smaller headcount or you know, things of that nature. So great economic impact uh, on using assessment to identify people more capable of doing the job. And next slide. So in summary, a couple of takeaways you might uh, gather from this is recruiter experience matters. What tools the recruiters have to manage their jobs? So assessments can be powerful tools to reduce recruiter workload. Show the example of just that workflow efficiency. And that's actually the least economically impactful component of the use of assessment is, is workflow efficiency. Assessments can increase new hire retention, and that's the second most economically viable. When you look at, you know, I know that SHRM just published its uh, average cost per hire of $4,128 and an average days open 42 days or something like that. And so you think of 
that just gets the employee to the door and then if they go through weeks or months of training i use the term cost to proficiency and that investment of bringing somebody from source to actually performing their job is a significantly bigger investment so every time you lose that early turn you know it creates a significant cost to the organization and then the last category for the recruiter experience is assessment predict performance differences so recruiters can look great and that they quickly identify those candidates more capable of producing high quality work achieving their performance targets faster and what do winners do well winners tend to use more locally validated assessments they use more types of assessments broadly across the organizations and in general they use assessment prior to the interview in entry level to mid-level jobs couple takeaways on the candidates. Candidates prefer more engaging types of assessments such as simulations and case studies. And that kind of 15 to 30, 15 to 60 minute sweet spot for presenting their KSAs. And obviously the more engaging the experience is, the better they're gonna feel about it. So that brings us uh, to the top of the hour. We appreciate you all joining in to participate. We don't do a Q&A here but I think Kevin will give us the wrap up and let you know how you can access this for the future. Absolutely. Thank you so much, Joe. So real quick, um, I got a quick comment for you, Joe, but first for everybody, feel free to reach out to Joe directly. If you've got questions for him uh, as well as myself, when it, as it relates to talent board and the candidate experience awards and our contact information is there on the screen. Also, this will be available on demand as well, and we'll make sure to get out to everybody, not only who attended, but as well as those who uh, couldn't make the live session today. So we'll make sure to get that out. Joe, one quick comment that I had that at the beginning, you were talking about you know, 50% of candidates um, that apply are really, unfortunately, a waste of time for a lot of organizations when it comes to how they're being qualified. One of the things that I find that I have keep hearing a trend of, and this relates to a lot of what you were sharing, is that organizations are making a little bit more easier at the front door to get in, but they're building in the back end processes, the processes that include assessments, for example, to then move people along the pipeline accordingly, right? So, but collapsing the front, the initial experience to like less than 15 minutes to get in the door, then moving them into the various assessments just depends on the job the company etc is that a trend that you're, you're seeing with a lot of uh, your customers as well um actually we're looking a number of our clients are actually doing analysis to see how can they attract fewer people because of the extra effort the noise the compliance requirements when you're accepting applications from people who aren't qualified you create a lot of noise and excess demands on compliance requirements reporting requirements and you create a bigger workload for the rejection process. And so we actually have clients looking at optimizing their sourcing to attract fewer unqualified candidates. No, which that, and that I've heard as well, that makes sense. Um, I just, I was mainly referring to just the, the initial application experience, but there is a lot to be said about having a better self-selection at the front end too, right? So, right. and, that, and getting more qualified candidates. Well, Joe, thank you so much. And thanks again, everybody for joining us today. And again, feel free to reach out to us directly with your questions. And we've got seven more great dog days of summer webinars coming throughout August. So thanks again for joining and we'll talk to you soon. And hope to see you in Nashville. That is right. Thank you, Joe. October 2nd. All right.